Uh, thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm Paulina. I'm a PhD student at Nanyang Technological University in Singapore, and I also worked with MakerDAO on making symbolic execution more practical, and that's what the talk is actually going to be about. So we'll take a look at why do we need something like symbolic execution, what it really is, how does it work, and how we can practically apply it to the smart contracts that we are developing. So why should we care about symbolic execution anyway? And the short answer for that is because we want to eliminate bugs from our code. And symbolic execution can help us with that because it's a very popular verification or a bug finding technique. So the problem of smart contract verification looks something like this. We usually have some smart contract source code. We want to make sure that it's implemented securely and correctly. And we can define a set of properties for it. Uh, properties essentially are a specification. It's a set of statements that describe how the smart contract should work, what it should do, what it should not do. Uh, a popular type of property is the balance invariant you can see on the slide, which states that the sum of user balances should be equal to the total supply of this token. Uh, we can also define a more general property stating, for example, that um, the contract should be free from particular vulnerability and so on. So once we have defined the source code and a set of properties for it, we can pass this information over to the verification tool that is going to use some mathematics uh, in order to analyze the input. And either it's going to tell us that all the properties hold and the implementation looks correct, uh, or it can also tell us that one of the properties is violated, uh, which indicates that there is a, some issue with the implementation. Symbolic execution and formal verification in general belong to a wide range of techniques that can and should be used in order to uh, perform the correctness and security assurance of smart contracts uh, with other approaches from this range, uh, including, for example, unit testing or fuzzing, which are more lightweight techniques, although very effective, so they definitely should be a part of any smart contract development processes. Uh, however, symbolic execution and formal verification in general are often seen as a more comprehensive way to analyze uh, the code, and well, we'll see why. So as I was looking for some example that can help me prove my point, uh, I came across this issue created in the Foundry repository. Um, I hope they don't mind me using that. Um, it's just a very illustrative example, but I mean, Foundry is a great tool anyway. Uh, so this code here that you see on the slide contains this very specific if statement, which requires that x should be equal to this very random constant. x is derived from new number, which is the input variable, uh, by subtracting one from it. Uh, so what the issue is saying is that for the fuzzer that is used in Foundry, uh, it's very hard to randomly generate the input that would make this condition uh, become true, therefore allowing the exploration of the corresponding execution path just because it's so specific. Uh, we'll talk a bit more about what fuzzing does. Um, yeah, but that's the issue and uh, symbolic execution can actually help us uh, with this particular case. Uh, I slightly changed uh, the change this code for the purpose of this talk. We're going to use it throughout the talk as an example. So what we have here is the function called backdoor uh, that takes x as an input parameter, as an argument. Uh, then we initialize the variable number. We set it to 99. That's just a random value. Um, we initialize z, which is x minus 1, where x is the input parameter. And then in this code, we have an if-else statement. What it means for us from the point of the analysis is that there are two possible ways in which this smart contract can be executed. Uh, if z is equal to 691, uh, I slightly shortened this constant, uh, then we set number to 0. And in the next line, we have an assert statement that checks if number is not equal to 0. What it means is that the assert is going to fail because we just set it to 0. 0 not being equal to 0 evaluates to false, which is the assert violation. Since asserts are commonly used in smart contracts to express conditions that should never evaluate to false, uh, a failing assert usually indicates a bug or basically any sort of issue. So that's the problem in the smart contract we'll be looking for uh, in this presentation. We'll be trying to detect this particular issue. Uh, if the else branch is taken, number is set to 1, and then the assert is not going to fail because 1 indeed is not equal to 0, um, at least using the arithmetics uh, we consider in this case. So the assert is not going to be violated in this branch, but will be if uh, you know, the true branch is taken. So we know it contains a bug. Uh, what techniques do we have um, that we can use in order to try to identify this issue? Well, uh, to start with, we can just try executing this code uh, by assuming that x has some concrete value, for example, 4. And that corresponds to testing. So that could have been a unit test. If x is 4, then z is 4 minus 1, which is 3. 3 is not equal to 691, so we're taking the else branch. Number is 1, 1 is not equal to 0, the third is not violated, 
and the bug is not found, even though we actually know that in the Azure branch it would have been violated. And that highlights the limitations of unit testing. So obviously unit testing is extremely important. Every project should use that. But it also provides us with limited information about different states in which smart contract can end up in. However, to increase the range of our analysis, we can also, instead of executing uh, the code on one specific concrete input, we can try to run it on a series of concrete inputs. We can run it on 15, 0, 1, very long numbers, something else. Uh, and that is what Fuzzin does, more or less. So if you weren't able uh, to catch uh, the workshop by Nat yesterday, uh, Fuzzin basically just runs the code on some randomized concrete inputs, hoping to identify some edge cases. Uh, however, you know, that's, that's a very specific, I mean, sorry, uh, that's a very effective technique that can help us identify uh, some of the issues. The potential problem with that is that we can keep executing the same execution path if in the interesting path uh, we have this very, very specific, very random condition that is very hard to satisfy using randomized inputs. And that's what the issue that I showed you before from the Foundry repository is saying. Uh, we can actually try it out ourselves to make sure that it doesn't uh, work. Uh, so here, I hope the font is big enough. Uh, that's the same smart contract that I've shown on the slide. And I also have prepared a, a Foundry project with a test uh, to try it out. So here we have the test backdoor function that calls this backdoor uh, within this test. X is the input variable. Uh, so it's going to be fast by Foundry if you're on Forge test. Uh, so let's try it out. Sorry. Um, yeah. So we were not able to identify this issue. The test can pass, even though we know there is a failing assert uh, happening in it. Uh, however, I also told you that symbolic execution can help us with that. And how does it do that? Uh, the general idea behind symbolic execution is that instead of running the code on concrete inputs, we assume that the input variable can be symbolic, it can have a symbolic value. A symbolic value means that it can potentially take any possible value, uh, but we'll be restricting the set of possible values that this variable can take um, in accordance with the conditions uh, that can be observed in the execution path we are taking. So we'll be narrowing down the possible set of values as we go through the contract, and uh, once we reach, for example, the final or interesting state where we want to check if the assert is violated, we can take a look at all these collected constraints and see whether that's actually feasible, or maybe the constraints are contradictory, so we cannot really end up in this state. So let's take a look at the example. If x is symbolic, then z is symbolic value minus 1, which is still pretty much any value, uh, especially if we assume that an overflow, uh, sorry, underflow can happen. Uh, if z is anything, that it can be equal to 691, but it can also be equal to anything else, which makes both of these branches uh, feasible. So both of them can happen now, and both of them should be explored, and then we'll finally be able to execute this, uh, identify this failing effort on the left. Uh, however, for this uh, if true branch to be taken, z should be equal to 691, and that's exactly the constraint or condition that we need to record. So for this execution path to be taken, z, which is symbolic value minus 1, we also establish the relation um, between these two uh, different variables. Uh, so z should be equal to 691 for, for that branch to be taken, for this to happen. Then we also want to check if the assert can fail in this case. So the failing assert uh, corresponds to the um, for, so we need the negation of what is enclosed in the assert to become true. So the negation of number not being equal to zero should be true. Um, so the number should be equal to zero. That's what we express uh, using this formula. So number, which is zero because we just set it to zero, not being equal to zero, and the negation of that should be true. That's, that corresponds to the failing assert. If that is true, then the assert is failed and we identified our issue. Uh, at the same time, we can also explore the else branch. Uh, however, the, the, the opposite uh, should be true. So z should not be equal to 691. And then, uh, in a very similar fashion, we're also expressing the failed assert. So number not equal to true, the opposite of that um, should evaluate to true for the assert to be violated. However, that's one example of these contradictory uh, you know, statements that I've mentioned before. Because number is 1, uh, 1 not being equal to 0 evaluates to true, the opposite of that is false, the assert can never be violated in this case. And that's good. So we, are, we want the asserts to not be violated. Uh, so here we don't have an issue, but we have one on the left. Uh, so what we did here, we took the source code, 
uh, and translated it into a more formal or logical representation that we can formally reason about. Uh, the input to a symbolic execution tool uh, usually is the source code or the bytecode uh, that we analyze, assuming that the inputs or some other variables are symbolic. And the output should look something like this. So we want to see that the backdoor function can be called with 692, which is 691 plus 1. Uh, for the assert to be violated. Uh, how do we get from these logical formulas uh, to the concrete, concrete output telling us the exact number with which we should call it? Uh, for that, uh, we use the tool that is called SMT Solver. That's a very sophisticated, complex piece of software. We'll just assume that it's, it's a black box. Uh, SMT stands for Satisfiability Modulo Theories. There are different types of um, SMT solvers. Um, you can see some of them on the slide. Uh, what they do, they take a formula that represents these this path conditions or constraints that we have collected, and it checks if they are satisfiable and under what, under what conditions. So what value, sh what concrete value should the symbolic variable take for this to become true? So the conditions you see on the slide right now, are, they are corresponding to the failing assert, so that actually can happen. Uh, so if you set it over to the SMT solver, it will tell us that this set of constraints is satisfiable. It can become true if x is 692, which is what we're looking for. If we supply a set of formulas that is not satisfiable, that cannot become true, such as one being equal to zero, uh, an SMT solver should tell us that it's unsat, which, is, which means that it's not satisfiable. No assignment to x, uh, which is a symbolic variable, uh, exists that can make it become true. Uh, the third possible option is, uh, I don't know, an SMT solver can tell us that it doesn't know if it's satisfiable or not, uh, if it runs out of resources. So in the previous slide, we performed this manual translation from the source code to this logical representation. Another more automated way uh, to do that is to just directly encode it into the language that an SMT solver understands. Uh, so let's try doing that. Um, V3 uh, is one of the popular SMT solvers developed by Microsoft Research. Uh, it has a Python interface. So in order to use it, we can run a Python shell. I can probably make the font a bit bigger. Uh, so what we need to do here, uh, we need to import everything from the Z3 library. And then we can start encoding our program directly into this language. So what do we have in our program? We have a parameter called x, which is a symbolic variable. And th what this statement is saying is that x corresponds to a symbol of type integer, which is an acceptable simplification for the purpose uh, of this talk. Uh, what else do we have? We have z, which is x minus 1. Uh, and then we set number to 99, uh, and then we get to our if statement. So what our if statement is basically saying is that the number is either 0 or 1, depending on whether z is equal to 691. Uh, we can express that using the if construct in v3. So we're saying if uh, z is equal to 691, then it's 0, otherwise it's 1. Uh, all right, so the only thing left is to check whether the failing assert can, can, actually, can actually happen. And for that, we use the function called solve. Uh, what we need to provide in, within this function is the expression we want to evaluate, uh, which in our case is the failing assert, which means it's a negation of the condition enclosed in the assert, which is a uh, number not being equal to zero, which is equivalent to the opposite of number being equal to zero. And there we go. So almost immediately, uh, the SMT solver tells us that it is indeed possible if x is equal to 692. So that's basically what symbolic execution tools do under the hood. Um, all right, so what existing symbolic execution tools are, how can we actually use it? Uh, we have performed a more or less comprehensive evaluation of existing symbolic execution tooling. There are quite a lot of these tools. Uh, it's a relatively popular way to perform vulnerability detection. Um, they differ in, implementation, in the implementation language, uh, the SMT solvers used in a lot of other aspects. Um, today, I want to take a look at Mistreal and EVMC, which are two tools out of, uh, well, all that we evaluated. Uh, so let's get back to our, our concrete example and see how we can run it and whether that works in general. Uh, so here is the code uh, that I've also, also showed on the slide. Uh, so let's start with Mistreal. That's a Python-based tool. Um, in order to run it, um, let's also time it. Uh, we can run miss, 
uh, int a, which is a shorthand for analyze. And then we, also, we only need to provide a pass to the smart contract we want to look at. And in a couple of seconds, um, 2.6 to be precise, it actually outputs the result. Uh, it tells us that the assert can be violated if uh, the backdoor function is called with 692, which is exactly uh, what we were looking for. Um, another tool uh, that we can also try is isbmc. So isbmc is a Rust-based tool. Um, it's relatively fast. Um, however, it doesn't take Solidity files as input, which is also common among verification tools for smart contracts. So first of all, we need to compile the runtime bytecode uh, for the smart contract, which we can do using uh, the compiler and providing the bin runtime flag. Uh, then we also specify the path to this contract. Uh, there we go. So now we get to the um, runtime binary that we can copy paste to the uh, configuration, sorry, configuration file of the, uh, that as if BMC takes. So it, we have to copy paste the code here and we can also set up some other additional values such as the balance of the contract we're analyzing, the nonce. We can set up the state here and specify the address of this contract that's going to be used. Uh, once we've done that, we can actually try running isbmc on that. Uh, we'll also time it. So we're saying isbmc, and then we provide the pass to this, uh, to this configuration file. And there we go. Uh, so it outputs the results in 0 0.2 seconds, um, which is extremely fast, if you ask me. It tells us that the assert can fail, and then it also provides the call data with which this smart contract should be called uh, in order for the assert to fail. However, uh, we also have to decode this. Uh, ourselves. So it does not tell us the exact function name and parameters, but it just you know, outputs this undecoded call data. Uh, however, uh, you can trust me, I checked that. It's exactly the output we are looking for, and this 2B4 is actually 692 in hexadecimal. So that works, and it's actually quite fast. Uh, another thing we can try is to make the, our example a bit more complicated. So in a lot of cases, um, it takes longer, more than one transaction, to get to some interesting behavior or identify some issue. So we can make our code a bit more challenging by adding the variable life, which is a Boolean variable, uh, to our contract that can be set using the set life function. And uh, this variable life should be set to true in order for the backdoor function to be executed successfully and reach the failing assert. So in this case, we'll be looking for two, uh, two function calls in the country example. Um, we can run uh, misreal on it again, uh, and we'll see if it's going to uh, show us some results. Uh, it takes a bit longer, but right. So now it takes 4.6 seconds uh, versus the previous 2.6 seconds, but it shows us uh, the output we were looking for as well. So first it calls the satellite function with the value true, and then it calls the backdoor function in a similar way as we did before. Um, for consistency, we can also try that once again uh, with the with isbmc. Uh, let's recompile the code. Then we copy paste the runtime binary, which became a bit bigger since the last time. And let's run it again. Uh, okay, it's still extremely fast, so it, it still takes less than half a second. Uh, this time it outputs two transactions, uh, the first one being live. This one here corresponds to the value true in the call data, and uh, well, the other call is same as before. Uh, but you know, we still have to decode it manually. Uh, an important thing that I forgot to mention, uh, we had to add the assertion failure detection ourselves. So in order to detect failed asserts, um, you should run our own MakerDAO's fork of the BMC, but it does detect some other vulnerabilities uh, by default. Um, so with this, um, we can see that Misreal actually has a very usable, uh, user-friendly interface. Um, it takes the Solidity files as input, and it's, it's very easy to run. And it shows you the decoded output. ISBMC is extremely fast, um, but it also requires a bit of additional work on the UX side. So that's one example of the trade-offs that are made in the existing symbolic execution tools. And there are some others. So um, well, there are always some aspects to evaluate uh, with the existing tooling. One way to make uh, symbolic execution more usable and practical uh, that I think is a recently uh, developing rapidly developing trend, is to perform so-called symbolic testing. So instead of running uh, our 
uh, symbolic execution tool directly on the smart contract and trying to analyze all possible function calls and all possible sequences of function calls until we find a vulnerability, what we can do is we can just symbolically execute the test itself. So in a similar way, uh, as we fuzzed uh, this test backdoor function before with Foundry, which was not able to identify the issue, we can also try to symbolically execute this call. So we'll assume that x here is a symbolic variable, and you know, we'll just execute whatever is included in the test. Uh, one very recent tool uh, that has been recently released is uh, Halmash. I think Halmash is the right way to pronounce it, um, by A16Z, uh, which is also very easy to run. We can just, let's also time it, we can just type uh, Halmash in the, in the command line. And uh, in three seconds, it tells us, again, that we should call this function with this argument uh, in order for, you know, for the assert to fail. Um, one thing that we have personally experimented with at MakerDAO is the integration of with BMC that we have just seen uh, with Foundry in order to um, you know, make it a bit easier to use and also uh, facilitate this uh, symbolic testing. So with isBMC, uh, we can write a function uh, that starts with the keyword proof because we need to distinguish between tests that are going to be fuzzed and the ones that are going to be symbolically analyzed. So the functions that start with proof are going to be symbolically analyzed if we say, if we run the forge test command. But for that, I'm, I'm also running my, uh, my fork of both Foundry and isBMC. But if you run forge test, uh, there we go, here is the result. Um, it outputs. Again, pretty fast. Uh, it shows us the, the decoded output uh, that says that we should call this proof backdoor test uh, with the argument 692. Uh, so we'll, here we leverage uh, the capabilities of Foundry to do the compilation uh, and, and the de decoding uh, of the output result, uh, which I don't know, I hope it makes it a bit more useful and user friendly. Uh, you can try it out yourself. Uh, we have here's a link to the blog post which describes more in more detail. It describes our experience of running all these tools um, and well, basically everything we had to do to uh, to analyze them. Uh, and also, we have prepared uh, the Docker containers for all the tools we analyzed in detail, uh, so that you can also uh, try them out uh, relatively quickly. Uh, with that. I would like to conclude my presentation. Thank you all very much once again, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Okay. Any questions? Hi, uh, sorry, I came a little bit late. Is this meant for developers developing their own contracts? Because how does that compare with just uh, code coverage or branch coverage? Uh, the, you know, it seems to do the same, or is it mostly used to analyze other people's contracts? Well, um, so ideally, I personally would love to see that being integrated in the development process, and that's also what we wanted to achieve with this project in MakerDAO. So ideally, the developer, with the symbolic test in that I have just shown, uh, ideally the developer should be able to run it himself in a similar way as he does unit tests or fast tests. But, but, isn't, but isn't unit testing with code coverage um, probably easier. <laughs> it is. It is. It is easier for sure. Uh, it's less resource intensive, uh, but this in this way you can get a slightly better, a more comprehensive analysis, more comprehensive results. They are more exhaustive. They cover all possible input states, ideally. But of course, that's subject to some constraint limitations that we have. Uh, but yes. So if if you look at um, some of the academic tools. Um, a, lo a lot of the tools that I have shown on the web sli on this slide with the uh, like the existing symbolic execution tooling, a lot of them are academic tools that are made specifically for vulnerability detection, and they're just being run uh, on basically the side so, of so, smart contracts. So on, on other people's contracts. Uh, sorry, can you repeat On other people's contracts. Yeah, yeah. So okay. you, you just uh, scroll them from Israel scan, and then you run it, and you identify a few thousand vulnerable smart contracts. Uh, but yeah, I mean, ideally. I would prefer uh, that uh, some, some of the symbolic execution would happen on the developer side, at least, you know, as, as, as a slightly more comprehensive way to, uh, to do, for example, fuzzing and unit testing, which is like in-house quality assurance. Cool, thanks. Uh, any more questions? By the way, I think it's the one of the most smooth live demo I've ever seen. <laughs> like it's 100% perfect. Oh, well, thank you. Right? <laughs> Thanks.
Yeah. Any more questions? Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay, yeah, go. Uh, so you said it's more resource intensive. I mean, now on this simple example, it was very fast. I assume that it's like, I don't know, exponentially more resource intensive. But what's the, wh what is like the, th the, the, input variable that makes it, is, is it the size of the contract that you're testing? Is it the number of variable? Like, uh, how, how can I decide what, what would be a realistic scenario to use uh, symbolic execution over, I don't know, something like fuzzing or normal unit test? Mm -hmm. uh, thank you so much for this question. I really wanted to, to talk about that. Um, so yes, unfortunately, um, you're right. It, it, as the, smart, the size of the smart contract grows, as we try to consider, for example, more users interacting with the smart contract, um, the number of states we have to analyze increases uh, exponentially. That's the state, state explosion problem. Uh, what makes it complicated? So we have this in the previous slide, I think I had a link to the to the post. We evaluated on a bit more realistic source code. Uh, you can try it out yourself on some of the uh, well, some of the smart contracts to see if it works. Uh, what makes it complicated is oh, basically a few things. So the size of the smart contract itself, um, the type of variables, I guess, m matters more than just the number of variables uh, because uh, hashing is challenging. So the main the main bottleneck with symbolic execution uh, is traditionally associated with this uh, with SMT solvers. So SMT solvers struggle with, uh, they are very sophisticated pieces of software. They contain like decades of optimizations, uh, but still they struggle with, with particular primitives, such as for example, hashing. So hashing is challenging for SMT solvers. And of course, uh, EVM like storage layout relies on hashing. So you have to either over approximate that or well, you have to implement some strategies that help you deal with that. Um, so, you know, reasoning about uh, large bit vectors is also hard, and uh, Solidity also, I guess a lot of Solidity smart contracts use unsigned integers of 256 bits, which are relatively large, so that's, that also makes it a bit complicated. Um, the number of you know, conditional statements you have to analyze, so basically anything that makes the, the, the formulas we're sending to SMT solvers bigger, um, you know, it, it involves some overhead, uh, and plus just some, you know, uh, some particular primitives that are used in EVM. Uh, of course, uh, that's, that's a very simple example that I just chose for the purpose of this talk. You can do um, more, uh, more realistic things, but uh, I mean, at the current stage, there is a chance that you'll probably run into some scalability issues. Uh, but you know, a lot of very smart people are working on that. So I mean, hopefully, we'll probably get some symbolic execution tool that works very fast sometime soon. Uh, one, one more question. Thank you. Um, can you also? Uh, like search over for uh, different like environment variables like the block hash or the timestamp or is it only function arguments that can be? Uh, you can so. do pretty much anything. I mean, it, that you, you can treat these environmental variables in any way you want basically. I think EVMC probably assumes that the, like block timestamp and block number are symbolic or you can do this you can do this yourself. So there is nothing stopping you from doing that uh, but uh, that's just some additional thing you have to reason about, so that potentially might also induce some overhead on the analysis. But yeah, that's, that's definitely doable, and I think that's actually being done by at least some of the tools. Okay, I think we can take the last question, if there's anyone interested. I'll give you five seconds. All right, thank you, Valina. Thank you so much.